Um, so thank you for joining us this morning. Um, obviously, we're here this morning for a LinkedIn workshop um, with our guest speaker, Dan Kent-Smith. Um, okay. Perfect. Uh, just to introduce myself quickly, uh, my name's Molly and I'm the event coordinator here. Uh, we've also got Kaz with us as well today as one of the attendees, um, Kaz Macklin, who is one of our membership execs as well. Um, we will be sticking about after the event too, uh, so if anybody does want to ask any questions about the chamber, you just want to introduce yourselves or anything at all, um, me and Kaz are more than happy to help, so we'll be sticking around for you. Uh, before I hand over to Dan Kent-Smith, our speaker today, uh, just a couple housekeeping rules if that's okay. Uh, try and keep your cameras on for us. Uh, it's so much nicer for us to see faces, to react a little bit, people nodding along, makes such a huge difference. Uh, keep your microphones on mute for us um, and use the chat function as well for any questions. Uh, we do have time for questions at the end. Uh, which I uh, so to put those in the chat for us and I'll make sure that we get those through to Dan and um, if we don't have time to go through all of them then I'm sure we can catch up afterwards too. Uh, the session will be recorded and um, it will be later uploaded to I'll put it in the chat in a second um, and the slides as well will be handed out to for you all so if anyone wants to catch up with anything they will all be available. Um, thank you very much and I will now pass over to Dan. Lovely. Thank you for that. Right. I'm just going to share my screen. Is that good? Does that come through? Yep. Excellent. Lovely. Thank you for that. Right. Okay. So uh, I realize not everyone's 100% familiar with LinkedIn. So hang on a sec. Is that still coming through? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm going to start with some of the basics. Uh, what is LinkedIn? Why it's different to every other social media platform? I will show you uh, why you need to be on it. I'll help you understand the mechanics of no like and trust in the context of social media and, of course, LinkedIn. Uh, but really, I, should, I guess I'll start with who I am. What qualifies me to, to talk about this? So this is me. My name is Dan Ken Smith. I was fortunate enough to work for LinkedIn for nearly five years. Uh, since then, I founded uh, NextPlay. Now, NextPlay is a group of ex-LinkedIn employees. So we all used to work there in various departments. We know the platform inside out. Decades of digital experience. We cover everything from personal profile building to lead generation, employee branding, content marketing, advanced analytics, whatever it is, it's within the context of LinkedIn. So today, we help businesses and individuals be, be more productive and successful through that LinkedIn platform. So you can connect with me, of course, through uh, through LinkedIn, linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash Dan Kent Smith. Uh, you, could, you can follow the company. There's always tips and tricks in there. That's uh, linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash next play dash agency. Or you can just send me a good old fashioned email um, and you can go through the, the website as well. Okay, so that's me. These are the offices I used to work in. Um, a slightly bonkers place to work really where you've got... Um, rather than chairs you had uh, these, these bikes that you could charge your phones when you're pedaling and things like that but uh, there was a bus there and all sorts of other things but anyway look linkedin it's the it's the single largest network on the internet for professionals this is where people come to find a job it's where they come to strengthen their professional relationships it's where they learn it's where they develop it's where they build their careers so there's somewhere around 700 million members globally in the UK, there's around 27 million members now. And to put that in context, that means it's around 80% of the entire UK workforce. That's huge. And so when people say to me that they don't know if LinkedIn's the right place for them, not sure if their clients are on there, I'm telling you your clients, they are on there. And not only are they on there, but 40% of all of these people are visiting on a daily basis. So they're there, your clients are there, they're active. And they're willing to accept the messages you're putting out there. So uh, LinkedIn is the largest professional network, 700 million members. That's just the tip of the iceberg. So the goal for, for LinkedIn is to connect the entire world's uh, workforce. And that's 3 billion, 3 billion people. They're getting there too. So back in 2017, Microsoft stepped in and bought LinkedIn for the, uh, the princely sum of $26.2 billion. Billion. At the time, that was seen as uh, rather expensive, but as things have progressed and as LinkedIn's getting baked into the Microsoft universe, that's becoming quite a bargain. 
So what you're going to start seeing is uh, LinkedIn's going to start, all your profiles will start appearing in calendar invites. They start appearing in emails. So uh, whenever you're sharing documents with people, PowerPoint, Excel, Word files, if you're sharing those with people, their profiles will start to appear in those documents. So you can get to know these people a little bit more. So it's fundamental that you make sure you get this side of, of things absolutely spot on. So what is, uh, what should you use LinkedIn for? So basic question, should you use it to find a job? Should you use it to recruit people? Should you use it to network, to actively network with people or to find uh, leads, some sales leads? Should you use it for that? Should you use LinkedIn to learn something or educate people? Should you use LinkedIn as your professional brand? Should you use it to get your professional news? And should you use it as your digital CV or indeed as a, uh, as a dating site? I'm not looking for answers, could be embarrassing. But there's two things on here that you clearly should not do. LinkedIn is for everything but really your digital CV. It's certainly not your digital CV. This is your brand story. You're the hero of that story and you need to convey it in such a way. It's so much more than a CV. And it really ought to go without saying, but it's not a dating site. I'm always surprised at the amount of people that I hear horror stories of how people are uh, being approached by other people in a, in a slightly uh, awkward manner. So uh, it's certainly not those two, but it is everything else. So I'm going to start really, the, the main part of this is about the mindset. So a few years back at LinkedIn, I ran a study which looked at the mindset. Now, uh, the mindset, we, we ran this study with TNS, huge market research company, uh, and we ran this globally across 6,000 uh, 6, respondents in 12 markets. And what we tried to understand really is how social media platforms differentiate. So this was not a, a self-serving piece of research. We just wanted to find out where does LinkedIn sit in that social space? How is it different? Now, at the heart of personal and professional networks, there's different needs, there's different interests, and there's different emotional drivers that fuel them. So we ran this study, really, because marketers developing their strategies in social networks, they sometimes forget that professional people are, they're people, you know, they do have emotions. Um, and so this is what we were trying to uncover. This is what we're trying to tease out. What we found is that actually within that professional space those emotions are absolutely profound they are deeply felt when they engage on those platforms they don't they don't engage as much because those emotions are more deeply felt and it is a reflection of their professional self but they're deep they're more deeply felt than you'll get in a personal networking space so one of the key things i want you to think about one of the key things you need to really take away is how these t's, t's apart there's absolutely a space for all of the the social networking platforms but when we look at these personal networks and by that I mean the likes of Facebook and Instagram and those kind of things against professional networks essentially LinkedIn what we found is that in the personal space people like to just socialize they like to be entertained they'd like to kill time you know back in the day when you're waiting for a train people are mindlessly flicking through their feed seeing what's going on it's a distraction uh, the emotions that are felt there it's about nostalgia it's about having a bit of fun and it is that distraction. So if you put this in context of a timeline, personal networking spaces are very much about today and in the past. And they're very, very often, they're a little bit narcissistic in terms of uh, look at my wonderful life and look at the car I've just bought and the holiday I've just been on and aren't my kids always well behaved. LinkedIn is the polar opposite to that. So this is where it's about maintaining a professional identity. How do you make your useful context? How do you search for opportunity? How do you connect to opportunity? And I'm not talking in terms of jobs, really. I'm talking about business opportunity. How do you grow your business in this environment? The emotions here. It's about achievement. It's about success. It's aspirational and it's very much looking forward. So it's present day and forwards looking. So really, there's a, there's another way to kind of think about this is that there's on one hand a casual mindset, which is your personal networking space. And on the other hand, there's a purposeful mindset in that professional space. And so this is how people start to move forward in their careers and in their business and in their professional lives. It's about that forward step, not backwards looking. 
so how do you how do you build trust now the, we all hopefully we all know the the mechanics no like and trust in the context of linkedin this is about being visible it's about engaging with the right people and it's about posting effectively so that's how you start to be known how you grow your awareness essentially think of it at the top of the marketing funnel how do you grow that awareness to be liked now this is uh this is an area that um, some people differ on because you may not need to be liked as long as you're trusted to do the job and you're respected and you're authentic, then actually you can do the job for someone. But to be liked, you, you need to be authentic. Absolutely. People will see through you otherwise. Not vanilla. You can have an opinion. LinkedIn isn't a place that's completely dry and bland. You can have an opinion there, but it's not self-serving. It's not all about me, me, me. It's actually, how do I help you? This is, um, someone coined the phrase givers gain what can you give to someone first to help them in their journey they're more likely to come back to you in droves so that's how you think of it in terms of like now to get to that trust element and this is a big thing so the trust side of thing that's the part that's going to convert into business you've got to be credible how do you prove that you know your stuff that you do this through writing articles and being consistently visible any good branding person will tell you that a brand is consistency over time that's how you build trust. Um, now, the, the thing I'm going to tell you here is that LinkedIn is the is the platform for trust. So when we've asked professionals which platforms they associate with a trustworthy source of professional content, there's only one real answer here, and it was it was LinkedIn. So if you were to post exactly the same piece of content across social media platforms, 72% of professionals will trust that in the context of LinkedIn compared to 30, 37% in other, in other social media platforms. So this is absolutely the place for building that content, that bank of content and making sure you've got your strategy just right. So that gives you a little bit of a flavor as to what LinkedIn is, how you should approach it. And I'm going to show you a, a short video on how uh, not to approach it. began his party career at the age of four when he went to John McGrath's birthday at South Hustle McDonald's. Hey, um, it's been pretty good weather at the moment. Are you going to do anything for the rest of the weekend? I've enjoyed this brief conversation so much, I'd like you to be <coughs> present at the birth of my child. Okay. I'd like to add you to my acquaintance network at Mediocre Party. I think it's really hard to meet people at this party. Are you having the same experience? Like, no one's talking to anyone. It's really strange. Michael specializes in a range of parties, including cocktail parties, masquerade balls, discotheques, dance parties, pool parties. So, it's been pretty good weather, dude. Are you going to do anything for the rest of the weekend? I have a vacant room in my house and I'd like you to move into it. No one's even coming up and talking to me at all. What's the point in being here? <laughs> yeah, no one's talking to me. There's probably no one even there. Okay, so now that kind of labors a point a little bit, but it, it's absolutely true. I, I deal with so many clients that say LinkedIn's not working for them, and we start to unpick why, what's happening, what do you do, what's your approach? And I'm working with a guy who was uh, working in property, and he says, So I, I managed to find my target audience, like my sweet spot, my target audience, and I'm connecting to them. And okay, that's good, you know, you're making the connections. What do you do next? Well, then I, I ask them if they're interested in, uh, in the properties I've got. And I'm saying, but that's crazy. You haven't built trust. You need to build this over a period of time. It's not an instant fix. <clears throat> Excuse me. You've got to think of the, the category that you're in and whether it's a high consideration category, because the higher the consideration, the longer it takes someone to actually build that trust with you. So it, you, can't, you, can't, um, you can't propose marriage on a first date. You do this over a period of time. But the other thing here is if you wouldn't if you wouldn't act like this when you're networking, when you're talking at an event or something like that, then don't do it on LinkedIn. That's really the basics of how we, we operate here. OK, so how do we grow together? How does the, the Kent Invicta Chamber of Commerce grow together? 
Now, on a very basic level, this is just about support. It's about how you support each other. How do you look out for each other? How do you network at scale? So everyone on within the Ken, uh, Invicta Chamber of Commerce, they're there to network, right? This is part of it. This is how you, you get to build awareness of your business. LinkedIn, the LinkedIn side of things is doing that networking at scale. How do you build it even bigger and quicker? And then you look out for each other. You look out for how people are, are working within the concepts of LinkedIn. What is it they're doing for relevant content? You're liking it, you're sharing, you're, you're commenting, you're helping each other in that way. Now, I'm gonna show you also how this goes through the, the LinkedIn system. Um, and I, I built this very short video um, on my iPad recently. Just, uh, I tried to, try to draw how the algorithm works. And you've got these four key areas. You've got the content itself, then you've got the user, then you've got a, the UCF, which is the uh, unified uh, content filtering system, and then you've got real life humans. So when you start building your content and you're building your post, whether this is um, a real life sponsor post or just a piece of content that you're posting organically, you post that and it goes through this unified content filtering system, which is essentially the, uh, the LinkedIn uh, algorithm that works here, the main part, the AI part, the artificial intelligence part of this. If that gets flagged uh, through a, um, a content quality score, so if that content's quality score is particularly low and it gets flagged that says, you know what, there might be an issue with this piece of content, it will go to uh, a real live human who would then check it and say, actually, you know what, this is possibly highly inappropriate and it will go through a filter which will then get flagged further and so it gets recorded in such a way. That's if, it's, if the content's bad. Um, now, assuming it's good and 99.9% .9 of the content that appears on LinkedIn is good and it will go through that system, it gets a tick, we'll go through and it will actually get displayed. So this is where it'll appear and it'll appear on the feeds of your, of your contacts. So the people that are following you and connected to you, and there's a slight difference there, it will go to those people, but only on a small scale. So it goes out to a section of those people and then it measures whether or not this piece of content is being liked. What's the engagement like? So that, I don't know if you can see this very well, but that's meant to be a little clock above the heart. So this is what's, what we consider dwell time. Now dwell time means if you're, if you're looking at a piece of content, you're scrolling through and go, oh, there's a piece of content from Dan. I know, let's help out here. I'm gonna just hit the like button and then flick through. LinkedIn's realizing you spent no time at all digesting that piece of content. So it doesn't give you any real credibility for the action that you've taken there. So it doesn't evangelize it. It doesn't share it to a bigger network. Assuming you do spend time on that piece and you, as if you're reading it, hopefully you would read it, but as if you're reading it and then you like it or then you comment, then the LinkedIn system will go, oh, you know what? This is a valuable piece of content and it will evangelize it and it will go to a wider network and then it goes around again, displays, grows and gets bigger. That's how it works. Um, and you've got to kind of consider really, one of the key components here and, and how I talk about LinkedIn is if you understand how LinkedIn make money, then you can understand how to navigate the system. LinkedIn make money through uh, advertising and they, they get to advertising really by, um, by the length of time people are spending on the LinkedIn platform. If the LinkedIn platform is not working for you and you're not spending time on there, then they wanna change things. So this is how they're giving you, talk about members first, it's one of the, the values of the company. Everything they do is for the members. What they want to do here is really make you stay longer on the platform because the longer you're there, the more advertising dollars they can sell against your name uh, as, as an aggregate. So if you start to appreciate that, then you can start thinking, how do you produce content which is gonna help you and be beneficial really to the LinkedIn platform. So, um, just checking time. Right, a couple more slides. Um, a very typical marketing funnel. How do we get to leads? How do we really get down to those leads? How do we filter people down through the system that goes from building awareness to educating people, to engaging with them and then turn them into a lead? And you can, you can label these in a number of different ways really but this is just how i've termed it at the moment how do you get to that lead well part of that is support and how you support each other and how you grow in that area but really to get to the leads we need to work backwards so we go back up to the top i have a lot of people say to me right we need to i need to get leads and i'm like great that's good that's our end goal that's what we want to get to 
Now let's look at some of the other components. How do we get there? And actually, a lot of people, you have to go to what's called a pre-awareness stage. Pre-awareness is making sure you've got your ducks in the line. Get your profile absolutely working for you. And I say this because everyone else is just a click away. If you look down someone's profile on the right hand side, you will have people also viewed. If your profile's not up to scratch, they will jump off and they will go to one of those other people in that pre people also viewed section. Good news is you can actually turn that setting off. I've turned mine off because I don't see the point in, in highlighting other people. If someone's looking at my profile, why do I want them to jump off to someone else? Go through your settings and turn it off. But make sure that's absolutely right. Think about it in terms of, uh, of a shop window. So if you've got one shop window and in that shop window there's, I don't know, a pair of shoes that you really wanted, but actually the shop window is peeling, there, there's paint flaking off, there's a cracked glass or whatever else. And then there's a shop right next door. It looks new, sparkly. There's the same pair of shoes in there. That's the shop I'm going into. That's how it works. So make sure you've got your profile right, your company page right, and your website absolutely spot on. Uh, the other thing we've actually getting those spot on is the relationship between LinkedIn and Google. So LinkedIn spend an absolute fortune on search engine optimization. So you don't have to really, um, if you get that right or not as much anyway. So um, you get that side of things right. When someone does a Google search, they want your profile to appear top of the rankings so that you then go back into the LinkedIn universe because again, they can sell advertising space against you. That's what it's about. Then you start thinking about how you get those side of things correct. Then you start thinking about how you connect. How do you build your network? And this goes hand in hand with how you educate and provide value. That's the first thing. How do you provide value for someone? What can you give them first? How do you prove? the benefit of what it is that you do. Once you've done those side of things, then you can start engaging at their pace. Don't jump straight in with, oh, and by the way, this is what I do. do you, I'm a financial advisor and actually I'm gonna look after your pension. Well, actually I'm not ready for that yet, you know? So just go at their pace. And then this is probably slightly counterintuitive for someone working in the digital space. Take it offline. That's where the magic happens. So, LinkedIn will get you 90% of the way. That final part, that final 10% is when you get them onto a phone call, you get them on a Zoom call, you get them, would you believe, in a coffee shop for a coffee or go for a beer, whatever it might be. That, that final step is where you really cement that relationship. So you've got to do all the other things correct because the first thing people will do would check out your profile, get those correct, and then you can take it offline. Okay, so, I've gone at an absolute rapid pace there and there's a lot to take in, I realise. But in summary, the mindset, make sure you get the mindset right. Getting that right is fundamental to how you approach LinkedIn and how you're going to be more productive and successful as well. Second part, authenticity. Build your presence. You've got to be authentic. That in turn will generate trust. And trust really is where LinkedIn comes in. LinkedIn is the most trusted social media platform. If you wouldn't do it at a party, or face to face networking event, don't do it on LinkedIn. Take that as a basic rule of thumb. Support each other, how you grow together. Do, do remember that dwell time, absolutely. Uh, leads, it can be an amazing lead generating tool, but you have to get all the other aspects right. And if you do, and if you do get that right, LinkedIn will enable you to be more productive and successful. And that's the key that I want you to take away from this. So that's, a hell of a lot of information. I've got a, quite a, a rapid rate of knots. Um, we'll open the floor to, uh, to any questions. Thank you for that, Dan. Does anybody have any questions at all? Um, feel free to ask in the chat and we can ask Dan or feel free to unmute yourselves as well if you like. And, and is there any chance of um, getting the sort of PowerPoint what you've done from you? I sort of missed the first five, 10 minutes. I, I've sort of taken some notes, but I wouldn't mind reading through it again at my own leisure, if that's possible. Mm. Yeah, we can provide that. Yeah, okay. So how do I get that from you? Do I do, who do I email? So um, Molly will have it. Um, send them out afterwards, yeah. straight to your inboxes for you. Okay, thanks, Molly. Dan, hi, this is uh, Nick Hawley. Um, there's a lot of noise, I call it, on, on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah. You see a lot of, yeah, a lot of junk and, uh, and so on. Uh, I just wonder, I mean, I guess it's the art of cutting through that noise and making people uh, interested in, in what you're looking to say. I don't know if you've got any tips on how you cut through that noise and yeah. 
you know, um, read me rather than all the other uh, stuff that's on there. So you, you've got noise in two ways here. You've got noise in terms of what appears in your own feed. Um, and if you're not spending a great deal of time on LinkedIn, then your feed is not working hard enough for you. It's not valuable for you. So then you can go through and you can start to tweak it and you can start to adapt it and change it. And by that, I mean, uh, let's just say, for example, uh, we're connected and you're seeing too much stuff from me and you're like, this is just not relevant. I don't want to see the stuff from Dan. You can unfollow me. We're still connected, but you unfollow me so that my stuff doesn't appear in your feed. Mm -hmm. So you start to tweak how it is that your feed will look by who you follow and how you unfollow. Uh -huh. How you build your uh, relevant hashtags and how you follow certain groups, uh, those kind of things. But then you, you've got to make it valuable for you. And this is what LinkedIn want you to do. They want you to make it valuable because the more valuable it is, the more time you spend in there and the more money they can earn off the back of it. That's yeah. and it's a very cynical way to look at it. And I realize that. But that's that's the, the reality of it. Um, how do you cut through in terms of things that you're posting? That is a, a much, much bigger question. There are ways of doing this, and uh, there's two views, two schools of, th of thought here. So when you are, a lot of people when they're posting, they are thinking purely in terms of reach. How do they want to stretch their message further? Um, and that's fine if that's your strategy, and we can do that and we can work on that. But then you can start really slipping down into a clickbait way of, of producing content, and that's not good for your own personal professional brand. So there's different ways of doing this. Um, there are little nuggets that you can do in terms of how you ask a question within a piece of content, how you, um, how you have your hashtags at the bottom of a piece of content, how you tag various people. So there are little methods to do it, but don't ever really produce content that goes against your own values, your own ethics, your own personal or professional brand. Um, but that, that is a much bigger piece. Um, I'm getting asked about this a lot more and I might put together a course. I was saying to Molly earlier, I might put together a course on LinkedIn content mastery. Um, I'll, I'll see if it's relevant for people, but that, that is, uh, yeah, I don't know if I've answered your question entirely. It's a much, much bigger piece. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I appreciate that. Thank you. We've had a couple of questions in the chat as well here, if I may. Mm -hmm. Um, so can a business page have more than one manager? Yes, absolutely. Yep. You can. So, and it's, it's probably wise as well. So I have had people come to me and say, they've got a company page, but the person who was running it has left and they can't get into it. What are they going to do? Uh, and then you have to go through a whole system that you have to apply through uh, custom services, prove what you're working and da, 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 da. It's probably good practice to have more than one person. So you don't have to go through those issues. You can give admin rights to people. It's not a problem. Okay. Um, and are LinkedIn pods a good idea to get more engagement? Depend, it really depends on the strategy. What is it you're trying to do? Is it that you're wanting engagement or do you actually want leads? What, you know, where are you trying to get to? You, it's about working on your business strategy within the context of LinkedIn. Podcasts are huge and they're growing. And I, actually, I'm, I did a few podcasts a way back. There it is. It's kind of sitting out of shot, hopefully. <laughs> But for me, it took too much time. It took so much time in the editing and getting it right and finessing it that I thought, you know what, when I look at the ROI of what I'm doing here, the podcasting isn't for me. You know, I kind of enjoyed it. I interviewed some brilliant people. I interviewed uh, a former world champion boxer, Billy Schwer. I interviewed Chris Akabusi. He was crazy, mm -hmm. uh, amongst some other people. Um, but really, for me, it wasn't working. Other people, it, it might work very well for them. But it's not necessarily about more content it's about more relevant content if you can get that rel rel relevancy right and in the hands of your target audience and it and it works well for them then it will work well for you thank you i've um, got another one here so with the viewing time for a post before it is then shown to a wider number of people is there a specific number of seconds so um with a video so with a video, if you've got your video set to uh, automatically play within your feed, and you can turn that off if you want, but if you've got that to automatically play and you sit there for a minimum of three seconds, that will register as one view. Um, with, the, with written content, if you click on the see more button, that will show, that will be a, a social indicator to the LinkedIn algorithm that you've spent time on there and you've opened it up. 
and it will measure really kind of the length of that article against the time you're spending. It might again only be a number of seconds, but it's key that you spend that time there to really show the algorithm you are interested. Otherwise, it just kind of knows. Um, the other thing to really consider there is um, when someone makes a post, it's more important to kind of react to it in the first 30 minutes or so. If you can do that, it will go further still. So that's how it works, because that's when the, the sweet spot of the algorithm goes, actually, this is generating a lot of interest instantly. Mm. Let's build it out a little bit more. Okay, that's really good to know. Um, got another one here. Do you think that the paid ads are worthwhile? Ah, again, it's a really good question, but it's, it again depends on what you're trying to do. So you can do paid ads for, um, think of where you are on the funnel. Are you trying to just build awareness? If you're just building awareness for what you've got, then the ads that really work hardest for you are the MPUs. Uh, the MPU is uh, the square, really, or 300 by 250 that sits in the top right hand corner of, of the LinkedIn page. That will work hardest for you in terms of your awareness if you get the, the creative right. Um, you've also got text ads at the top. I've never used text ads, even when I'm working at LinkedIn, I didn't really see them working particularly well for people. Then you've got other ads, which is more around um, building an education. Like how do you educate people as to what it is that you're doing? And that's the sponsor content. That's the stuff that fits in the feed. You get more words into what you're doing, but again, you've got to get that positioning right. Then at the bottom of the funnel, if you're thinking more around conversion, you've got lead generating ads where you can have lead forms on there as well. Or then you've got real conversion stuff, which is in mails. If you're paying for in mails and you can measure all of this. But what I would say is it depends on your objectives, what it is you're trying to achieve. Then it's about mon monitor measuring it and monitoring it to see the ROI of your spend. And you can start small. You can start with a uh, hundred pound, 200 pound, give it a try. You know, it's not going to break the bank. Give it a try, but make sure you're getting your objectives right, your strategy right, and you're choosing the right ads that are fit for purpose for what you're trying to do. Work hard on the creative, because what I used to say to clients is that we can get your ads in front of the right people, the right time, but what we don't have in, uh, influence on is the creative that you're producing. So if it doesn't work, that's down to you rather than us. That, that's kind of the philosophy. Would you recommend a bit of like split testing, perhaps something Absolutely, like that? Yeah. So you can do your split testing, you do your, yeah, your AB testing, see what works, but there's lots of little bits that we used to work on. And I used to, used to go around doing a, a creative road show and showing people how the creative, if you tweak it and change it, it will work for you. Little things like eyes follow eyes. So if you, if one of the key things that you've got is someone to let's say click through to a, a webinar, and you had someone on that piece of creative and they're looking at the link that says go to the webinar, you'll get more hits on that than someone looking directly out of the, of the creative. Very simple things, but it works. Brilliant. I've got another one here. Um, I would like to post videos, but I don't know how to edit them. Where can I look to find out how to do this? There's lots of editing software out there. Um, I have used, Actually, I've just because I've got a Mac, so I just use the software that's in in within the Mac world. Um, whew, I don't know. I, you might want to even turn if you're going to start producing videos. You might just turn to uh, someone, a video production expert, or you can. I mean, you use it off your phone. You can use your phone, um, and there is the the iMovie uh, piece of software off your off your Apple phone. Um, but think about you've got to think about other things. Think about your settings. Think about your background. Think about um, not doing it as a selfie where you're holding it right there in front of you. Buy yourself a little tripod. It's only been a tenner off of Amazon or, or something. Um, other. Dan, we have lots of members that can help out. Lavender Blue, um, right. lot, lots of, uh, so get in contact with me, with, with me afterwards. We've got many, many skilled members. Our right. own patron, Sleeping Giant, can help out. Lavender Blue. Lots of value chamber members that are really good at this sort of thing, so they can help out. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, perfect. Uh, we've got another one here. Oh, Sally, I think you've got your hand up at the moment. Did you have a question to ask? Feel free to unmute. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Dan. Hello. Uh, I have a question around um, the etiquette of asking people to follow the business page. So at the moment, we will post something on our 
Pittman Training Maidstone and Canterbury page. Yep. And then me as Sally Miles will share that because it's actually me that's got all the connections. Yeah. Um, and whereas, whereas the Pittman page has got very few followers because it's nothing, we've never really asked anyone to follow it. Yeah. Um, I just wondered if there was, um, if, the et if there was an etiquette to kind of try and encourage people to actually follow that business page. Yeah, so this, this again, it's a good question. This comes down to how well you know the person, um, if you know them particularly well, and you give them a reason to follow. So, I mean, I've only just started building out my company page, but it's, it's an absolutely necessity because it shows you in a more professional light. So you'll never get as much engagement on a, on a company page. You just won't because people, they deal with people and they respond to people. Um, but what you can do and what you should do really is when you've got corporate kind of content, company based content, when you post it on your company page, then you repost it through your personal page. So you're kind of doubling up on it a little bit. So you go through that method, but it just shows that you, you need this, uh, this flow of information that goes from you personally, because you represent your corporate brand into your company page and then into your website. So that flow needs to be seamless. And if you don't have one of those components, it's not going to work for you. So don't get hung up on the, uh, the metrics of the company page. It's just a nece necessity there, but give people a reason to follow it. Why should they follow it? Um, I mean, if you were to, if you're following my own company page, I put tips and tricks in there for how to use LinkedIn a little more. I might put one in there about the whole, something I mentioned earlier about turning off the people also viewed function. People don't know this stuff, right? And it's a valuable thing. Why do you want someone to go to someone else doing the training just because they can see them? Forget that. It doesn't help. Helps LinkedIn because you're getting more page views and they can sell more advertising. It doesn't help you personally. Thank you, Dan. Helpful. All right. Uh, got one more here, uh, two more here, I think. Uh, so what is the difference between a connection and a follower? So a follower, um, you can deny someone a connection request. Um, someone might reach out to you and you think, actually, no, they're, they're not helpful, they're not beneficial, and you shouldn't connect with just everyone. I think I'm going to say no. They can still follow you, so they can still see what you're producing in terms of content. Okay. Um, and is there an optimum time slash day to post to increase reach? Oh, so now, <laughs> yeah, now people talk about this um, and they will say things like uh, Wednesday between 10 and 12, best time to post. And you can push back and go, why? Tell me why. And they say, well, that's where the most traffic is. And you say, yeah, but that, that's not my audience. You don't know about my audience. You don't know what it is they do, how they operate. You don't know my industry. So actually there isn't a best time, generally, there are better times. And this depends on you and your audience and your network. So the thing to do here is to actually play with it. So try posting on a, on a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, see yourself. You have to measure this stuff to really understand what's working for you. Once you can start understanding what's working for you, you can tweak and modify your approach to make it work harder for you. So there isn't a single good time for this because it, it's very dependent on what you've got as a person um, and actually the relevancy of your, of your content. For some people, maybe it's a Sunday night, you know, when people are thinking, getting into the work mindset, maybe that's what it is. It's hard to say. Uh, what I can tell you though, is from a study that I ran at LinkedIn, is that uh, more than 50% of content is consumed on a mobile device. So think about that in terms of making it, it's a horrible phrase for you, snackable, make it snackable. Um, and also more than 50% of content is consumed, generally speaking again, outside of working hours. So this is, but then again, this was, this was before the pandemic when people had longer commutes and things like that. So it's hard to say. What I'm gonna say is play with it, toy with it, measure it and adapt accordingly. And um, one from Ian as well. I don't know how to say this name. Does Dan work as a Jurgen, Jurgen Klopp lookalike at the weekends? <laughs> I quite like that one. <laughs> you know what? I did a presentation and I had a baseball cap on as well and someone else said that. Um, <laughs> no, uh, I wish. <laughs> uh, last one, unless anybody would like um, any other questions, then pop them in the chat now. Um, sharing a post these days doesn't seem to have much doesn't seem to gain as much traction. Do you know what's changed? So they're constantly tweaking the, the algorithms. Um, 
there is there is more content out there so it's harder to to cut through the noise um i think that there's a fine line between producing content that's that's going to go wide and viral as against self-serving um content as against actually content that positions you in the best light so if I'm going to connect with you guys on this on this call on this Zoom call, the first thing I do is check out your uh, profile, and off the back of that, I can see the content that you produce. And if it all looks like clickbait and you've got great engagement, I still don't want to really work with you because I can see you're going down a clickbait path. I mean, why would I? So it's about having something of value, um, and initially at least, not getting too hung up on those metrics. Uh, understand where you're starting from what you want to see is an improvement over time. So that's where it is. And I, and I know things are tougher at the moment because a lot of people are, are on LinkedIn, which means there's more content, but it's just showing how do you tweak and modify your approach to show a gradual improvement in what it is that you do. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, has anybody got any last minute questions? If you do pop them in the chat now, otherwise I think we will start rounding up. Oh, just one more thing I was just going to say, one more quick thing, something that just popped into my head, is that with LinkedIn, people sometimes think it's, it's difficult to talk about themselves and it feels a bit egotistical or selfish or, or maybe a little bit narcissistic. But if you believe in what you do and if you believe in the business that you've got, you've earned the right to talk about it because you can give someone a benefit of working with you. So you've earned the right to talk about what it is that you've got and what you can do for them. So that's what I would say, really. It's not a selfish thing to talk about yourself in that context. You're providing awareness of the service or the products that you've got, and you're putting it in, you're putting that benefit forward for the benefit of others. Brilliant, thank you. I think Sally, have you got another question there? Oh, yeah. Dan, you've mentioned clickbait a few times. Yeah. Um, I suspect everyone's definition of what is clickbait is going to be slightly different because we've all got a different tolerance level to what, we, what we're interested in or what we think yeah. is quite self-serving. Hmm. Um, what, what would you consider to be clickbait or just acceptable promotion? So clickbait can be uh, when you, partly when you needlessly tag someone um, when it's not, not relevant to them. Um, I mean, actually, if, if we were to put a post out after this, after this call, um, if Kaz and Molly was to put one out and tag everyone on this call, that's absolutely relevant. We're all here. You know, it's up to you guys if you want to push that further. But that is relevant. But then if you start going, you know what, there's another few hundred people or thousand people within the chamber, I'm going to just tag all them on as well. That doesn't work as well. That becomes then more clickbait based. Um, having loads of questions in there that are not overly relevant that you're just trying to spark a reaction that again is clickbait um so those kind of elements but they no i was gonna i was gonna name drop some people who i think do this but that wouldn't be good and that wouldn't be fair <laughs> no, i won't we are recording <laughs> yeah, right. so, but you will know as soon as you're going through the feed you will see stuff and you'll just think really are you just trying to get a reaction from me because if i react then it goes slightly wider that's what it is Okay, cool. Thank you. I think we've had one last one here as well. And then I think I'm going to call it with the questions. So sorry, I've probably worn you out. Um, I've been asked to do the marketing for a company that I work for. So should I use my own LinkedIn page to post about their business page? Uh, it depends how invested you are in the company. So this is what's called now we're moving into employee advocacy. Now, this is a really big thing, I, I think. If you can get your employees and yourself included, uh, to post for you, then that will generate actually more traction than going through the company page. It will also help with um, how you may retain staff, how you hire new staff and how you get new clients. If you get employee advocacy just right, it's a tough one. But um, what you want to do within that space, if you're doing the marketing, um, hang on, is this person, do they not, they don't work for the company? Is it, a, are they, are you um, an agency, a marketing agency that's working for another company? Oh, yes, I work for them. So if you're an employee, then absolutely, you can do it through your own company page and stuff. If you're, for those who are not employees, but they're working in that marketing space, 
then the ideal is to actually find the employees and do it for them like a ghostwriter. They, they're the ones who should be building this. Fab, thank you. I think I'm going to round it up now with the questions. Um, <laughs> your mind must be a little bit bright. <laughs> but thank you so much for that. Away, you know? <laughs> thank yeah. you. Um, and after this as well, obviously it is a LinkedIn workshop, so I will send out a list of attendees so everyone can link up with each other afterwards. Um, it seems like the right thing to do. Uh, what I might do now is just say a massive thank you. We can all do a little virtual clap, round of applause. <laughs> thank you, Dan. Um, oh. I'm actually going to hand over to Kaz, who's just going to round up the event for us today. Oh, we're on mute. Sorry, yeah, I'd lost visual for a moment. Really great, Dan. I found that particularly useful. Nice to see so many of you guys here. Um, just to finish up uh, with everyone, we've got some virtual business networking on Tuesday the 1st, uh, sponsored by Furley Page and hosted by the wonderful Luke Lauter. That's 10.30 to 12. Uh, free to chamber members, which is wonderful. We've also got Turning the New Normal into Business, which is Thursday the 10th of September. And that's going to be quite interesting as well. So lots going on with the chamber. Uh, uh, lots to uh, keep you engaged and also to make the new contacts. Connect with everyone on LinkedIn uh, via the participant page today. It's always useful. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Molly, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks all. Bye-bye. Take care. Dan and Molly, if you could stay.